everyone, welcome viewers. Um, we have quite a nice audience. Uh, this will be recorded um, and archived and available on YouTube and uh, Speedcast and a couple of other sources, I guess. So um, I'll try to put up some show notes uh, with the links to whatever we will be talking about. Um, so you can you can watch it later or send it to your friends afterwards if you like it. We'll do. Um, Okay, I guess let's just start with with basic. Um, you two have a common history, actually. Um, Roger, you attribute the knowledge that allowed you to understand Bitcoin to to FEE and to you reading FEE a long time ago. And Jeffrey has his history with FEE as well. Can you talk a bit about that? Go ahead, Roger. Roger. I, I think you might be frozen. So I, I heard the yeah, first sure. half of your comment there, that Jeffrey and I have a similar background there in regards to was my reading, you know, books and publications by FEE and, and the Freeman and, and various things like that when I was younger that allowed me to understand yeah. why Bitcoin was going to be so important and, and allowed me to get involved in Bitcoin. And Jeffrey's been involved yeah. in uh, FEE. Uh, for quite a while now as a, I think a senior fellow is maybe the official title there, Jeffrey, or? Distinguished, yeah. Distinguished fellow, yeah. So what, can, can, you put, can you put a finger on one or a couple of things that, that you read, or was it a long series of articles or something that you would recommend to people to read? Um, to get the, the connection between Bitcoin and Liberty and Austrian. Um, and it's, it's hard to choose one just because there's so many important ideas and concepts. But if I had to narrow it down to one, maybe a, it, there's an essay called uh, I Pencil by Leonard Reed. And basically he in this essay, it's not very long. You can probably read it in five or 10 minutes. But he, he points out that there's not a single person alive on the entire planet that knows how to make a pencil. And at first that just sounds preposterous. Like, of course, everybody knows how to make a pencil. Like a pencil is so simple. But then he goes into detail as to how difficult it would be to make the yellow paint. And then you have to cut down trees somewhere else and then move the, the lumber for the trees. And then the rubber comes from rubber trees somewhere else and the graphite from some mines. And there's all the specialized equipment that comes, has to come together. And, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of people all over the world have to cooperate with each other in order to produce something as simple as a pencil. And in reading that essay, you kind of realize pretty quickly that central planning cannot work. Everything is too complicated. And it's the pricing mechanism that transmits all the information to all these people all over the world as to what resources should be used to produce what goods. And no central planner could ever hope to even come close to being uh, as efficient or as knowledgeable as you know these tens or hundreds of thousands of people or even millions of people around the world coming together voluntarily and you know exchanging their ideas and their resources and their labor to produce things as as simple as a pencil and bitcoin is kind of a that sort of concept incarnate like anybody can participate with anybody else and there's no central controller there's no middleman there's no there's no authoritative guiding force um so maybe if i had to pick one essay that would be the one and it's called i pencil by leonard reed i'm sure it's available for free online and it's a, a really kind of eye-opening essay and I'm curious to hear if, if Jeffrey has any thoughts in regards to that, if he had to pick just one. Okay, I'll, I'll... Well, you know, <clears throat> Roger, you were way ahead of me on Bitcoin. Uh, uh, so I have to congratulate your, your intellectual uh, sense and your, and your insight. I had been reading in the free market literature for, you know, 20 years. And uh, particularly, I'd written widely on monetary policy. And even though I understood that uh, money, money did not to be, need to be controlled by a central bank. I didn't quite believe that it could be, in, you know, created more or less out of a out of a computer code. You know, I I always thought we'd have to reform the dollar, like turn it back into a gold standard. So when Bitcoin came along, I was very much a skeptic. You were a very early mover. You used your knowledge to kind of like move into the space. Uh, in a sense, I had like in a way overthought the topic. And I and I didn't really believe that Bitcoin could exist because I I, I really thought that gold had to be uh, the money, you know, and I and I was just uh, kind of wrong about that. But eventually, um, a group of Bitcoiners uh, surrounded me, and this was, would have been in January, or February of 2013, and showed me 
the way it actually works. And so I, I read about it, and then I immediately realized this is the free market currency that we had always dreamed about. I just I couldn't see it, like I had overly intellectualized it. <clears throat> and then I began to read a little bit more. And my favorite essay, well, there are two favorite essays I have on the topic of money. One is Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? Which really shows that money is not a distinct uh, thing. It's just a, it's a commodity. It's a property like, like anything else. In the case of Bitcoin, it's a digital property. And the second essay is by F.A. Hayek called The Denationalization of Money, which was written in 1974. And this is a fascinating essay because he says, look, I've been working my whole life for monetary reform, urging governments to do the right thing. But now I'm an old man. I got the Nobel Prize. I realize governments will not do the right thing. So we have to try something else. And he suggested that private parties, particularly banks and, and um, uh, investment brokers, uh, ba basically create a new money to, uh, to substitute for government currency and sort of denationalize money through the back door. It was a very radical essay, and it was criticized by all economists at the time. But it just turns out he was, you know, basically 40 years ahead of his time. You know, uh, that's so. I love that essay. Those two essays are my two favorite. What has government done to our money by Rothbard, and uh, the denationalization of of money by Hayek. But again, I I do want to emphasize that um, uh, Roger had special entrepreneurial insight. I mean, he you know, had the broadness of mind to imagine something completely new. It's not like you find the plan for Bitcoin in the works of the Austrian economists, you know. You, you find a hint that it might exist, but it takes, it takes somebody like Roger, who's, who's like an entrepreneur, to see, oh, this might work. And so he moved into the space very early on, long before anybody else was really uh, convinced that this could be, could be real. And so it, I, I think I was probably three years late you know, compared to, compared to Roger on the on the subject, but now I now I realize uh, the genius uh, that it really represents. Yeah, I, I think uh, if I recall correctly, we, we didn't Jeffrey and I didn't yeah, know each other did. at the time, but it was at the Liberty Forum event in New Hampshire, and it was me and Eric Voorhees and Ira Miller and Gabe Sikinik, and we kind of cornered you, and, and Gabe set you up with a Bitcoin wallet, and uh, I think that was kind of uh, the beginning. And at that same event, we actually got. Uh, to corner Tom Woods as well. And Eric Voorhees and I were talking with Tom Woods, explaining Bitcoin to him. And, and up to that point, he'd kind of been skeptical. And then I remember very clearly, he, he asked myself and Eric, and he said, if Bitcoin is really as good as you guys say it is, why isn't everyone shouting about it from the rooftops? And we told him we are, and that's why we cornered you and we're telling you about it now. And uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest hurdles that Bitcoin has to overcome is that when people hear about it, they think if it really is that good, why isn't everyone shouting about it? It, it just seems too good to be true, but it really is that good. And, and finally now, people all over the world really are starting to get involved in a big, big way. Well, you know, Roger, after I went, after... See, so fast forward a year later... And after after I went home from New Hampshire, after you... Yeah, uh, go sorry, ahead, I'm go sorry. ahead, Thomas. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, uh, fast forward one year ago, and Tom Booth is actually writing, uh, or has, has published a book about Bitcoin, or co-published. Yeah. So after, after I left, after I left that New Hampshire conference, you know, you, you had uh, bought some... Um, the bow ties from here. I sold. I sold some bow ties there to some Gabe. of the people, yeah. like Charlie and 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 to Gabe. And so I came home with Bitcoin on my on my blockchain wallet, and and I went to a site called uh, <coughs> Bitcoin Store, which I think you found it actually. If I'm I'm not yep. sure, but yep. yeah. And yeah, and and I and I spent it. I was sitting alone at my dining room table, right? So I'm like pulling up my computer. Went to the Bitcoin store and I bought the first thing I could find, uh, with the first item on the site, which is a pair of crimping pliers. Like I didn't need crimping pliers for any reason whatsoever, but I, I wanted to use Bitcoin. So I, 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 uh, I spent uh, some money on some crimping pliers and it just took me a second, right? Like I scanned the QR code, I pressed the button and it was done. And, and, I don't know if you remember the first time you ever spent Bitcoin, but I had this like awesome feeling that I was participating in some kind of like weird science fiction futuristic project, you know? And I, and I, I closed the browser and I just had this like heaving sense of like, wow. 
I got up from the table, I pulled away the chair and just like did a like a groovy dance all around the room, you know, because I, I just knew that was it. This is the currency of the future. I just like it locked in at that moment. I was like hands in the air going, yes, it's, well, when, it's done. Whenever these days I'm using the internet banking, I find it fascinating how someone can claim Bitcoin is too complicated to fill in all those fields um, to, you know, or, or filling credit card to be afraid, like booking a flight ticket with credit cards is just so scary uh, because you can get through all this process and all, all of a sudden at the end you make a tiny mistake in the credit card and, and, and you get screwed. And I mean, someone tells Bitcoin it's too complicated. So. I, I agree. I, I, um, I agree with that. Okay, but I mean, still, it, it is, it's a little, it's, it's intimidating for people. I, I mean, probably electricity was scary, right? When it first came out. And, and flight was scary, you know. So I think Bitcoin is still a little bit scary because people don't, are, yeah. it's just not familiar, you know, that's all. Uh, Jeffrey, you wrote a book, uh, Bit by Bit. Uh, I'd like to talk about it here as well. Those who don't know it, um, um, you can, if you join liberty.me, uh, you, you get it for free or you can, you can uh, download it or buy it from, from Amazon Kindle store. Um, you, um, you touched the various topics related to Bitcoin, to blockchain decentralization in the state. Um, and you actually wrote uh, a very nice path leading to the Bitcoin um, by various Austrian economists, uh, economists starting with Menger. Um, can, you, can, can, can you can talk about that a little bit? And, and what was the Menger's initial role in, in this long path leading up to... Um, yeah, in the late now? 19th century, there was a big debate in Europe over, over, over money. There were two generally competing theories. One was called the state theory of money. It came out of the German historical school and the German economists. And they argued that, that government is the thing that gives money its value and that uh, money emerges from government uh, creation. And that without that sort of public social consensus uh, with uh, imposition of law, there would be no such thing as money. So therefore, like we owe the existence of, of money t to the state, you know. Uh, Karl Menger, representing the Austrian school, argued the opposite, that really money is an emergent phenomenon, that it comes out of, of natural exchange on the market. It begins in, the market begins in barter, and money represents a, a kind of uh, a facilitator of exchange, and it, a tool that you acquire not to consume it, but to acquire it in order to facilitate further exchange. So it becomes a, a kind of a tool of, of indirect exchange, a facilitator exchange, and therefore a, 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 a carrier of, of value. And he pointed out that money has many properties like, um, like fungibility, divisibility, durability, uh, high value per unit of weight, uniformity um, of its qualities, and things like this. These are all the features of money. So he argued that money was really an, um, something that grows out of natural human experience. It's not something imposed from above. Uh, from above. And that's the Austrian. That's the beginnings of the Austrian school with uh, with Karl Menger. You can still download his essay. It's called uh, "On the Origins of Money." And in many ways, like his story that he tells is the same story of Bitcoin, you know, which itself emerges out of the market. I mean, it was introduced, um, the blockchain um, was introduced in uh, early January of 2009, and Bitcoin begins to obtain its first value and something like per first posted value in October, I believe, 5th of 2009, so something like 10 months later. You know, uh, where it was like something like a fifteenth of a penny. Roger probably remembers these days. I don't. I, I wasn't there, so I don't. I don't know. But um, it was something amazing. Roger, were you were you um, using uh, blockchain technology in in two thousand? No, no. Unfortunately, no. I, I first heard a bit about Bitcoin when it was between five and ten cents, but didn't look into it deep enough to fully understand it at that point. And it wasn't until a couple of months later when. Bitcoin was closer to 50 cents that uh, I thought, oh, my God, this is going to change everything, which was still pretty early in the grand scheme of things. And in a few years, we'll look back and at $230 a Bitcoin, it'll look like, oh, my gosh, Bitcoins were so cheap back then because uh, 
it's so clear that it's it's headed towards mainstream adoption all over the world. Uh, it, it's happening, and uh, I was pretty confident about Bitcoin a, a couple of years ago. I'm even more confident about it today because it really is being integrated all over the world. And if I can talk about your book a little bit more, there, Jeffrey. Um, you know, I've been involved in Bitcoin uh, uh, almost exactly four years now, and uh, I actually learned quite a few things or, 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 or had a few thoughts put into my mind from your book that it hadn't occurred to me before. And some of, initially I was just really excited about Bitcoin and saw it as a way to separate money from state. But Jeffrey's book, Bit by Bit, I, I think it's a really good eye-opener for anyone to read because it points out that it's more than just about money. This blockchain and distributed technology is about distributing everything and letting everybody in the world interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without needing these centralized organizations to control and restrict the ways in which individuals are able to act, interact with each other. And, and Bitcoin is just the catalyst and one of the first steps that's, that, that's, that's pushing that forward. But there's all sorts of other things that are going to be distributed as well, thanks to blockchain technology, everything from, from property contracts and law. And one of the Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. So I, I began to realize something extremely important that I hadn't entirely understood until very recently. Um, the Leviathan state, as it emerged in the early part of the 20th century, with with uh, wage controls and 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 war and central banking, antitrust regulation, income taxes, all of these massive institutions that that states constructed in the early part of the 20th century were all designed to kind of intervene between people's desire to bargain with each other that emerged in the late 19th century. The 19th century was largely an age of laissez-faire. So we began to see these emergence of peer-to-peer uh, -peer technologies, like first the telegraph, right? And then, and then, and then um, you know, we began to see through that communication technology a, gr a growth of other technologies like internal combustion and, and flight, the age of steel. I mean, civilization began to go on fast forward in, in a big way. In the early part of the 20th century, what you saw was a kind of revolt by the ruling class. They said, look, there's enough of this. Uh, the wrong people are getting rich. Um, there's too much social progress, too fast. The elites are being overthrown. It's threatening our positions in power. So they began to disable uh, the peer-to-peer um, -peer systems that were emergent in the late 19th century. So then we lived through like a century of, of terrible things happening, where states have been trying to prevent us from bargaining with each other. Um, but in uh, basically at the turn of the millennium, we saw the first evidence of uh, new kinds of systems, distributed networks that were enabling people to once again recapture their rights to communicate with each other and trade. And then with the blockchain now we have the first time that we see the possibility of using technology to title, commodify, bundle information and transport them on over geographically non-contiguous lines in a way that's non-forgeable and non-reproducible. It's like a freaking miracle, right? So we see the possibility within this technology of a recreation of the age of laissez-faire, not just a recreation but a massive expansion of it, that goes around the whole um, uh, intermediating institutions that the state has created, these third-party trust agencies that have uh, that prevented us from, from constructing the kind of world we want uh, to build, just because of our nature and our freedom and our ambitions to, to better our lives. So that's, to me, the significance of the blockchain. It's not just about money. It's really about human life itself and, and our rights to, to, to trade with each other. That's what my book is about. And uh, you mentioned the, the marriage. Uh, you were the first person to, um, I don't know what to call it, uh, witness um, um, a marriage on, on blockchain. Can yeah, you, can well, it's kind of cool because we have all these debates right now about, about marriage, you know, like who can get married, what are the conditions, what are the terms. Why do we have these debates? It's because just like money was nationalized in 1913, the marriage licenses came about uh, at the same time, basically during the so-called progressive era at the early part of the 20th century. And what it did is it put uh, the, the government in charge of marriage, which is crazy if you think about it. It's like, you know, marriage should be between individuals, you know, on whatever terms they want. There shouldn't be a government that stands between people going, you can, you can't. And because of that government institution, it's highly politicized and we're all debating the question all the time. Well, the blockchain offers a chance for us to uh, contract these kind of intimate relationships in a way that's um, just between individuals and not, in, not involving 
uh, states, but also are kind of enforceable, and you have the possibility on the blockchain to resolve disputes that may or may not have emerged in the case of, of weddings. So yes, I was very pleased to ask to uh, officiate the very first uh, blockchain wedding. As far as I know, the first one in history, and that that happened, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago. I was very moved by it. At first, it seemed like a little bit of a silly idea, but then as soon as the bride began to march down the aisle, I started crying, <laughs> like I was like tears. And then I realized this is hugely significant because it offers the possibility of of actually privatizing um, a marriage and, and taking it back to what it always was in history, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship. And it's made possible today by, by the blockchain. Um, Roger, um, Jeffrey mentioned, and he also described um, in, in, in his book, Bit by Bit, the, the main features of the money that people expect on, and, and if there was a free market in money, they would uh, they will they would want those features and would choose the money with those features. Um, can you talk a bit and explain how Bitcoin actually achieved these features like the fungibility and scarcity yeah, um, and, and, and so on? Technologically, it, it, it has all of those. I mean, the Bitcoin, the, the supply is scarce. For the most part, every Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin. Or if, if it's not, you can mix them up with some other ones. So they then become the same as every other one. And you can send them anywhere in the world. They are, they're, they're lasting. They don't deteriorate. They don't corrode. Um, when I read about Bitcoin, I realized that this is, has all the ideal characteristics of money. Um, and I, I read, you know, all these books when I was younger and, you know, Von Mises and Rothbard and, and, you know, Adam Smith and all these. And, but I think I also actually had kind of a, a first-hand experience. For, for those that don't know, I, I've spent some time in federal prison. You can Google that and read about it. But I got to see firsthand in federal prison money emerge from consumer goods. So in prison, money really is. It's uh, postage stamps, tobacco, and top ramen soups. And you see an entire economy emerges out of spontaneous order with people, with people paying each other to do various tasks and various jobs for each other. And it's all completely illegal. It's completely forbidden by, by the guards in the system there. But it's, it's such an integral part of human nature that of course human beings are going to trade with each other and money develops out of spontaneous order and, uh, people are using it. And I got to witness it firsthand with my, my own eyes and it was, it was plain as day. People are going to use whatever is convenient as money, and the, and and Bitcoin has all these wonderful characteristics that make it more convenient to use as money than anything else that uh, we've had on this planet up till now. So uh, it became really clear from uh, my practical experiences in life as well that Bitcoin was going to become money. That is really really fascinating. Uh, I find it fascinating. Yeah, that's really fascinating. That yeah, I find it fascinating that you suggest. That uh, that the that the government is not able to enforce uh, the prohibition of something. I mean, how that's not possible. If they get you know uh, in their head that something is forbidden, like you know trading cigarettes or something, then they make it work, don't they? The the audio was a little bit choppy, but no, their their whole goal there is to dehumanize and take everything away from you that makes you human. But uh, humans will continue to be humans uh, no matter what, and will continue to trade with each other for forever. I I, I wasn't. I, but one of the main main. Uh, I, I went to I, I went to jail for uh, just a little while, not long enough to see uh, money emerge. So I don't have as much street credibility as, as you have. Um, but uh, I find it really, really interesting that um, that your experiences in that regard, you know, showed you that money could emerge spontaneously, and that that contributed to your uh, knowledge and awareness of, of Bitcoin. That 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 is tremendously fascinating to me. That you can learn more about monetary economics in prison than you can at an Ivy League university getting a PhD in economics. Yeah, to, to be fair, at the same time, while I was in federal prison, I, I was rereading uh, Murray Rothbard's Mayan Economy and State for the second time. So I was reading the, a book on the subject and then watching, you know, it, it emerge firsthand as well. So it was really a kind of a fun experience to see the the theory being put into practice. I wish I wish we had all been in prison together. That would have been a really wonderful experience. <laughs> I'll pass. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay, but w one of the fundamental features that Bitcoin sh uh, that money should have. Is uh oh, looks like it's just you and I, Jeffrey. Oops, I think we lost him off. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Hey, can you tell me? Oh no. Oh, we've both gone. Oh, there we go, Tomas. There we go, Tomas. Hello, hello. There we go. Now, now Roger's gone. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So one of the features of money should be scarcity, and everybody's talking about digital money and how easy is it to send Bitcoin as, as email. And um, so, why? What should make us believe that Bitcoin is really scarce that you can't send the same Bitcoin to two people? Um, can you explain that to in, in layman terms? Because I'm there, I know there are people in, in the audience and will be people in the audience who still maybe can't get, get their uh, head around it. Sure, I'd, um, I'd be glad I, to I, explain I, that if, if... Go. Or, so the, the idea with... Yeah, I plan sure, to... The, so what, what's so different and fundamentally different about Bitcoin than any other payment system or any other money that we've had previously is the way the, the ledger is set up that keeps track of who owns which Bitcoins. With PayPal or Visa or Bank of America or whoever, they have a centralized ledger that keeps track of who has how much money in each account. And whenever someone sends money to, from one account to another, they just update their ledger. And the problem with that ledger being in one place is that that gives them the ability to freeze people's accounts or reverse transactions. Or if the government comes to them, they can do whatever the government tells them to do. Bitcoin has a ledger as well that keeps track of who owns what Bitcoins. But instead of that, that ledger being on one server and one computer and one office, that ledger is spread out across everybody's computer all over the entire planet that's running the Bitcoin software. So it's on tens of thousands of computers across the planet, including the one that I'm talking to you guys on right now. And that ledger is called the Bitcoin blockchain. And it's all over the world, so there's no single point that anybody or any company or any government could go to to modify or control or, or restrict. And that ledger upgrades together in sync. On, on average, every upgrade happens about uh, every 10 minutes. And each update to that ledger is called a Bitcoin block on the blockchain. Um, so a new block is created about every 10 minutes, which records all the transactions that have happened since the previous block. But the, the key amazing part about it is that it's not in any one place. It's, it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And that kind of makes it uh, invincible from centralized control. Yes. The, the, and um, so what's... So then ahead, the network is very, very closely monitored. Um, there's a great deal of incentives to to make sure that all the rules are adhered to. I remember in April 2013, Roger probably remembers this too, there was a block admitted into the blockchain that had insufficient number of confirmations. And as soon as that was discovered, um, the community uh, demanded a fork in the chain. And uh, the blockchain was forked. And the the price fell about uh, 10 or 20 percent uh, during this time, and then uh, the enough confirmations came in for the new uh, block that had been admitted to the chain, and uh, the the fork was was healed, um, and and everything went on just as it had before, um, and the price rose back up again. The whole operation lasted about 20 minutes. That's the only blockchain flaw I've personally ever wit witnessed. But I thought it was a beautiful illustration of um, just how much more thoroughly transparent the blockchain is than, for example, Federal Reserve policy, right? I mean, so one slight problem appears, one slight uh, uh, issue with rules uh, appears on the blockchain and everybody's like freaking out, you know? Whereas with the Federal Reserve, nobody has any the slightest clue of what's going on, including the Federal Reserve chairman herself. You know, so it's just a completely different uh, kind of system in that way. Or including the German uh, German Central Bank, who has no idea whether their gold is in those vaults or, or it isn't. Um, Jeffrey, um, regression theorem. Um, there's this is probably the the biggest division between um, or you know in between. Um, Austrian economics community, whether Bitcoin um, adheres or you know validates or 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 it it rejects the the, the regression theorem. Uh, can you first explain it a little bit, and then how do you think this relates to Bitcoin? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. It's a kind of a question of high theory. At some on some level, it doesn't really matter because uh, 
Bitcoin is a currency, so that's just a, a fact. So whether it adheres to the regression theorem or not is neither here nor there. But nonetheless, it is an interesting theoretical uh, problem. Um, the regression theorem postulates that you can't introduce a currency without it having a pre-existing value as a as a barter uh, commodity. You know, so people look at, at Bitcoin and go, well, that that can't be currency because it it, it was never a, a, a real thing on a barter market. But I think this is really a confusion because the, the regression theorem is based ultimately on <clears throat> the idea of the pre-existing commodity having use value, not so much that it's a physical thing, but rather that it have a use value. And in the case of Bitcoin, the use value d derives from the blockchain itself, which, which provides the service of titling and commodifying information bits and, and enabling them to be ported um, across large geographic lines in a way that's non-forgeable and non-reproducible. That itself is an amazing service. So that, that use value of the blockchain service uh, came to inform and, and feed the value of the unit that enables the blockchain to operate, namely Bitcoin itself. And as I said, that took about 10 months. So within that 10 month period between January, and, um, uh, early January and, and October of 2009, you saw kind of an unfolding of the, the regression theorem uh, taking place. It's not possible to think about um, the, uh, about Bitcoin apart from blockchain technology. And it's not possible to think about the blockchain technology apart from Bitcoin. They're really united in one thing. This is a very much of an intellectual challenge for economists because within Bitcoin you see a unity of the currency and the payment system. Those are one. We're used to thinking them as, of, of them as separate, but within uh, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin ecosphere, they're really united in, in one one thing. This is, I think, the essence of the technological innovation <clears throat> that Bitcoin represents. And it requires a little bit of a intellectual and mental adaption to fully understand it. But I think that's how you resolve the, the puzzle of the regression theorem. And, and people who don't understand that, for the most part, don't really understand what the blockchain is and what it does. Um, you touched about the the, um, the the relation of Bitcoin and, and blockchain, uh, and there is actually a question from the audience uh, related to this. What, um, maybe Roger could answer this. What do you think is more important, Bitcoin the currency or Bitcoin the network, and, and why? Um, I think they're both important. Like Jeffrey said, they're they're both kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, so separating them isn't something that... Uh, to me, the question almost doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, people are going to do all sorts of other amazing things using the Bitcoin blockchain, but it's still the Bitcoin blockchain that's being utilized to do those other amazing things other than money. So um, money is just one of the first really cool things that people are doing with it. But uh, it's kind of two sides of the same coin is, is the way I see it. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, there's another question about Open Bazaar, but before we get to that, uh, I'd like to speak a bit about about Silk Road. Uh, Jeffrey and I uh, wrote about it uh, before Roger spoke about it a lot. Uh, we all support it. Uh, Russell Brief or whomever DPR is. Um, could you both say a few words about it? What what Jeffrey what 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 was Silk Road, in your opinion, and what happened? Uh, Silk Road was an, exper uh, an experiment uh, run by an idealist uh, named Ross Ulbricht who uh, wanted to see what would happen if you could create a genuine free market. Uh, how would it organize itself? What would, what would happen under those conditions? He was convinced that the, 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 the market as we know it is seriously truncated and filled with prohibitions and restrictions on, on people's ability to you know, get along with each other and, and make their own bargains. So he wanted to create a kind of uh, open system that allowed people to trade whatever they wanted. That was the origin of Silk Road. It was an, an experiment, really, in free markets. And Ross had written me before he built the Silk Road asking my opinion about what I thought about this. And my answer to him was that if you start such a thing, I said, just make sure that you make it real, because this experiment would be very important for the knowledge base of humanity. But um, you can't uh, just make it a game. It, it should really be 
people trading real goods and services. And um, I didn't know what Silk Road was going to turn into, obviously, when I corresponded with him, but I offered at the time to uh, host the website uh, for him. So um, I'm a little bit surprised that the FBI never actually called me. <laughs> and I, I've always uh, wondered why I didn't have them breaking down my door over the last uh, year. And in fact, I'm slightly disappointed that I was never called. Uh, I'm not breaking bad nearly enough, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, but he, Ross was an idealist who really wanted to see what this market would look like. And, and actually, it was an enormous success. Uh, the problem was that he didn't expect that he would run in, run afoul of uh, essentially the, the drug lords and the drug cartels, uh, which work hand in hand with governments. And so you got you, he, you know, two of the most powerful forces in the world, uh, uh, you know, uh, nation states and, and drug cartels uh, ganged up to shut down uh, the first iteration. Of, of, of this online marketplace. But of course, I mean, he's a terrible victim, but it didn't stop the technology. Now you have uh, literally dozens of similar marketplaces existing online, and nothing's ever going to shut them down. They're just getting bigger and bigger. Right now, um, there are many online marketplaces that are 10 and 20 and, and many times uh, larger than the original Silk Road. So, um, Ross is very much a victim of this very temporary effort on the part of governments, which, which raises a very interesting point to me. And if I can speak to this just real quickly, um, one of the reasons that governments have thrived for the last century is that they ha have diffused the costs of statism out to the general population and concentrated the benefits among special interests. But with peer-to-peer -peer technology, what we're doing is turning that logic on its head and we're diffusing the benefits of markets throughout the whole of humanity and concentrating the costs of stopping them uh, among a handful of bureaucrats and, and judges, uh, essentially, and, and police state agents. And the costs are actually too intense. They won't be able to stop it because the benefits of peer-to-peer -to -peer -to technology are spreading throughout humanity. And it's not just about narcotics online. It's about every form of good and service that's, that's moving ever more to this peer-to-peer -peer relationship. This is extremely important for the future of humanity and the future of human liberty itself, because we're, we're reversing the logic that gave rise to Leviathan. We're now uh, turning it inside out and changing the, the political dynamic itself. And I personally feel like it's unstoppable. There's going to be a lot of victims along the way. Uh, people like uh, our, our, our dear, dearly be beloved uh, Ross Ulbricht. But on the other hand, this is very short term. They can slow us down, but they cannot stop us. Roger, you called uh, Ross a uh, hero on multiple occasions, and you actually supported him uh, big time. Um, can you can you talk a bit? Yeah, I, I was actually just looking for it. Somewhere I have a screenshot of the terms of service for the Silk Road. And it was an incredibly powerful statement of, of you know voluntarist free market ideals. And uh, they specifically forbade anyone from being allowed to sell anything that's sole purpose is to harm other human beings. Uh, and they he made a lot of points about how we'd like we don't uh, expect you know the the to be bailed out, we don't, you know, steal from people. We don't, you know, we don't want anything but peaceful interactions with other human beings. And uh, I think the future will probably look back on Ross Albert for uh, creating the Silk Road the same way we look at uh, the Wright brothers for, you know, kind of the first flight. And now there's other people building other interesting tools that are going to be the equivalent of jet engines coming along. So the Silk Road was just kind of, you know, the very, very first test flight, just like the Wright brothers had so many years ago. But now much better and faster and, and more efficient and safer uh, tools are coming that are going to allow people to engage in free trade all over the world. And there's nothing the tyrants uh, can do to stop it. And uh, I hope that the DEA agents and FBI agents and people that are involved in this sort of thing and trying to shut it down will take a few minutes and, and reflect upon themselves and what they're up to and realize that if you're locking peaceful people in cage for buying and selling products that make them happy in life, you're the bad guy. And you need to stop. Uh, and Bitcoin's giving us a way to put those people out of a job. And they're going to have to go and find peaceful work 
and honest work rather than locking, you know, enterprising young young men in jail for making the world a better place. And, uh, you know, any FBI agents or people that are listening to this, what you're doing is wrong. You need to stop. Go and find honest work. There's plenty of it out there. Use your creativity. Don't use guns on, on peaceful people. That's a great message. Um, now, after Silk Road has been shut down and, and a couple of other sites like that, uh, there's a uh, push towards decentralizing all these services. Uh, do you, uh, Roger, do you know anything about Open Bazaar, about uh, Storage and Mate Safe, uh, things like these that Samuel, Samuel has been... Uh, yeah, if, if the Silk Road was the first little test airplane of the Wright Brothers, all these other things that you mentioned are... Uh, you know, becoming more and more refined and, uh, you know, maybe the equivalent of, uh, you know, jet planes are, are coming on the way. And uh, a lot of those things you mentioned are going to be that. And they're going to be uh, beyond the control of any, you know, group of men with, with guns wearing fancy suits with uh, shiny badges. Like, it doesn't matter. Uh, the laws of mathematics don't care about guns. They don't care about shiny badges. They just work. And uh, it's really exciting to see all these incredibly brilliant people all over the world building the tools that the rest of us peaceful individuals need to be able to protect ourselves from those violent individuals that want to use the force of the state con to control peaceful inter uh, individuals with interacting with each other. And uh, every day when I wake up in the morning, it's just so exciting for these projects like Store J and, and, and Open Bazaar and all of these things. And uh, man, if the, if the FBI thinks they had a hard time shutting down the Silk Road, and there's already a dozen more that have more volume than the Silk Road ever had, it's too late. Like the war on drugs has so clearly been lost. And uh, I think every one of these additional websites and arrests that the DEA agents and FBI agents make just make them look like more and more of a fool, like trying to, you know, bail out the ocean with a with a bucket. Like there's there's too much water. There's too many people all over the world. It's an unstoppable tsunami of freedom that's coming because of all these technologies. And, uh, you know, the war on drugs has been lost. It is over. Game, set, match. Give up. <laughs> yeah. And Jeffrey, you wrote about this in Bit by Bit, actually, in, in your concluding uh, chapters, uh, the the secession and the revolution, and how these technologies, what what has been so difficult um, just decades ago. You mentioned this this um, I forgot his name on this island uh, outside of the UK, who have effectively seceded from the UK, uh, but it was extremely difficult to get on air back then, and you know, to, to passports and this kind of stuff. Um, but now you explain how, how these things are becoming so extremely easy uh, to, to secede and to completely change the way we live off the grid and outside of Libya. No, I mean, I think the important thing to remember here is that the nation state is artificial. It's, it's contrary to human nature. It's not what we want. And what we want is peer-to-peer -peer en engagement. That was very difficult 50 years ago. Uh, now we have all the tools uh, we need. Roger mentioned uh, the Open Bazaar, which is an absolutely brilliant project. I'm also an advisor to a company named Fact Factum, which uh, is a kind of a, a ledger that, that allows you to title any, to offer property titles for any, anything like wills and, and deeds and anything that involves documentation of, of property ownership. Now, this is a very nice project. Another, another one is Ethereum. I mean, there's so many and so many B2B projects along the way that are using blockchain technology. I mean, people are, I mean, it's, it's amazing to think of what's going on right now, you know, and, and it's not, it's, it's mostly happening without a lot of public attention. Journalists don't know about it. They don't understand it. You know, I was on the phone with the New York Times, um, I guess, last week, and they're trying to write an article about uh, Bitcoin 2.0 technology, and the journalist was, you know, just, you know, at least she cared, but she knew nothing about it. But essentially, you have some of the world's most brilliant minds right now hard at work constructing an alternative uh, like sphere of engagement you know that that exists outside the nation state that 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 floats above the, the crazy things we call uh, borders and states and and allows humanity to kind of come together to to build civilization uh, together based on these distributed network models it's very beautiful and extremely inspiring and we've only begun to see the be the, the beginnings of this really I mean I think in the next five or ten years, this stuff is going to uh, uh, going to become the you know the stuff that's going to liberate humanity. Uh, the nation state cannot survive this level of of innovation and and what Roger called the tsunami of freedom. I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. 
there's no way, no state in the world that can shut it down. We really do have the killer app, uh, I would say, for the nation state at this point. It's just going to be a matter of time and hard work. Uh, Jeffrey, you mentioned um, in the, there's a question from Mike from the audience. You mentioned in your in your uh, book and also in your speech in ISFLS uh, altcoins. Uh, can you talk a bit about them? And what yeah, alt you know? altcoins are very interesting. It all started with Litecoin. Uh, Charlie Lee, you know, innovated uh, Litecoin, which is based on a slightly different protocol from from Bitcoin. And uh, from that, you have all these kind of uh, spin-off coins that are being created, each of which have their own sort of culture and special functioning. I mean, uh, dark coin, you see, has been rising over the last several weeks, ever since the Ross Ulbricht verdict, which is a very interesting coin in itself, because what it does is it, it once you, you, you send out of your public address, it scrambles uh, uh, coins and, and remixes them in a way in which Roger mentioned earlier. You can do this because... Uh, because uh, cryptocurrencies are ultimately fungible, and then spits them out on the other end in a way that obfuscates their origin and makes them land in another public address, so you cannot actually uh, uh, publicly connect uh, the, the, two, uh, the two addresses. That's Darkcoin, that's just one example. Another example that's very popular these days is, is Dogecoin, you know, which, which is a, a very funny and interesting currency because uh, it's, it's weirdly inflationary in a, in a funny way. It's, 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 it's got a, a massive uh, qu quantity distribution and a, and a huge rate of, of money creation, but it's very charming and people uh, like it. But, but really, I, I think last, last count, I saw something like six or seven altcoins that are valued over uh, one dollar uh, in their exchange rate uh, relative to the American dollar, which is which is by itself a miracle. Like Roger probably remembers when Bitcoin got over one dollar, everybody was like freaked out. Like, is this really supposed to happen? You know, is Bitcoin really supposed to be valued more than the U.S. dollar? Is this possible? And my understanding, I wanted to ask Roger about this, is that a lot of early adopters actually sold Bitcoin at one dollar because they thought it could never go higher than that. Well, yeah, that's well, now you have. If you go back and look on the forums, though, you can see people making the exact same arguments when Bitcoin hit 10 cents for the first time. People were saying this is a bubble. Bitcoin can never be 10 cents each. It's going to go down. And and today we look back and laugh like you are and think, look how silly that is. But the same thing is going to happen with Bitcoin at $230 today. Like people say, oh, when it hit a thousand, people were saying it's a bubble. This can't last. Do the math, right? There's there's only what, like coming up on 14 million Bitcoins in the world, right? I live in Tokyo most of the time. There's uh, more than twice as many people uh, than 14 million living in, in Tokyo in the metropolitan area, right? There's not even enough Bitcoin for everybody in Tokyo to have half a Bitcoin. And this is becoming the currency for the entire world. Of course, Bitcoin is going to be a lot more than $1,000 a Bitcoin. We're going we're to laugh at the days when people claim that a Bitcoin at $1,000 was a bubble. It's going to look silly, just like it looks silly when, when people were claiming that at 10 cents, Bitcoin was a bubble. Isn't it so beautiful, uh, too, that we have... Yeah, I think that pretty much answers Adam. And, and we have currency competition now for the first time, a global currency competition, you know? So with these altcoins, you've got the possibility for, for uh, people to innovate and uh, a switch from currency to currency, each of which lives on a separate uh, you know, ecosystem. And, and, and in many ways, this is the realization of a Hayekian kind of ideal, you know, of competing private currencies. I mean, it's weird. I never thought I would live to see the day when something like this was actually happening right before my eyes. One of my favorite websites is called Brave New Coin. It covers the altcoin market very, very carefully and, and thoroughly. And, and I like to follow altcoins uh, as well as Bitcoin. And for those that are interested in altcoins, there's another really interesting website called shapeshift.io. And uh, it's, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to shapeshift from one altcoin to any other altcoin instantly. Um, you know what the exchange rate is in advance. You don't have to create an account. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to give your email. You don't have to give your tax ID number. Uh, it just works. And you can instantly convert from Bitcoin to Darkcoin to Litecoin to Dogecoin to Ripple to whatever you want right then and there with no account registration uh, uh, needed whatsoever. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that it is. Uh, what's the guy in New York that's trying to do the bit license? I, I'm sure it's his favorite website. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Roger, can you talk about this really interesting shopping site that you think is a, a kind of a very important way to popularize 
um, Bitcoin and to incentivize people to shift that allow, allows you to, to purchase uh, through Amazon.com uh, people's unused credits? Sure. So um, up till now, the most of the adopters of Bitcoin, I think, are people that have been philosophically motivated. Uh, I think the vast majority of people on this call are, are here for that sort of reason. But uh, there's another website called purse.io, like a woman's purse, P-R-S-E dot I-O. And uh, there's lots and lots of people all over the world that maybe they have like an American Express card and they have the reward points that they can convert to Amazon store credit. Or there's another service that Amazon has called Mechanical Turk where they pay people all over the world to do tasks online. And all these people wind up with a bunch of Amazon.com store credit that maybe they wouldn't necessarily want anything from Amazon or it'll cost too much to ship where they're at. So what this website, purse.io, does is allows anybody who has something that they want from Amazon, you can add it to your Amazon.com wish list, submit it to the site that acts as an escrow, put the Bitcoins on escrow with them, and one of these other people will buy the goods that you want from Amazon. Amazon ships it directly to your house. You receive it. The other person receive the, receives the Bitcoins. And the net result is that you can get a 20, 25, even a 30% discount on whatever you want from Amazon.com shipped directly to you from Amazon. There's no risk of fraud because you don't release the escrow until you physically receive the goods. And then these other people receive the Bitcoins. Uh, so I've been buying all sorts of stuff. Uh, I just recently bought an iPad Air 2. I got a 29% discount. I saved like $180 by using Bitcoin. And uh, it was the first time ever I've seen lots of people that aren't philosophically motivated. They think, you mean I can save 20-something percent on goods from Amazon by using Bitcoin? And I can buy uh, Bitcoin for about a 1% fee? Show me how. And they get so excited and they start doing that. So I really think that this is an amazing tool to get all the people interested in using Bitcoin that aren't philosophically motivated to, to do so. So if you have friends or family that don't care about monetary policy, they don't care about free markets, they don't care about any of it, tell them, hey, you can save 25% buying your next set of laundry detergent by using Bitcoin on Amazon.com or absolutely anything that Amazon carries. Set them up with a Bitcoin wallet, show them how to buy Bitcoin and show them purse.io and it's going to, I think, attract millions of new users to Bitcoin that wouldn't otherwise have a strong use case to use Bitcoin. And uh, it's really exciting to see it uh, happening right before our eyes. So people are starting to use it. And if you haven't used it yourself, try it out yourself, test it out. You'll be amazed how easy it is. And once you've seen it in action, uh, it'll be easy for you to explain it to your friends and family. So that's purse.io. We'll have that in the, sh in the show notes. Um, one, I highlighted one, one question before we started this discussion, so I'd like to uh, get it, uh, get to it. What do you think uh, ongoing events in Greece is going to give Bitcoin a boost? I don't have, I, I don't have a strong opinion about that, but I, I, I about Greece in particular. But I, my, my expectation is that in the future, um, national currencies and Bitcoin are going to work together in exactly the way that Roger describes. So you're going to get these increasing. Um, systems of interaction because blockchain technology is so efficient and so much cheaper than than uh, trust-based systems like credit cards that, that I think we're going to see increased incentivization for people to move into Bitcoin but I don't believe that at least in the near term we're going to see uh, Bitcoin emerge as its own separate uh, ecosystem but uh, in the event of a currency crisis all of that begins to change you know, um, then cryptocurrency can become a kind of um, safe haven. And uh, it, this could happen tomorrow morning. You know, it could happen to the dollar, it could happen to the euro, it could happen to, to any currency, that uh, things just begin to spin out of control. As we know, most of the banking systems of the world are inherently uh, bankrupt as it, as it is. And, and some one trigger will come along, and I don't think anybody can anticipate exactly what it's going to be. And we could see a, a mass global flee into uh, Bitcoin and or some other cryptocurrency. And in that case, uh, we'll start to see the separation of national currencies and cryptocurrencies, and we'll begin history anew, essentially. And, and, and what will precipitate that? I don't know. Uh, you know, it could, be, it could be the euro, it could be the dollar, it could be uh, the end, it could be, could be really anything. But at least now we have a safe haven. And I personally feel like uh, cryptocurrency is beginning to replace precious metals as the 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 um, the safe haven of choice. Or put an addition 
Um, another question from Scott Anonymous. Uh, regarding the internet and systems like Meta, would it be conductive to liberty and privacy if it was run on the current global infrastructure or would it uh, only be optimal running on a, on a global mesh? I, I think project? global mesh nets are coming. Um, they're not quite here yet, but uh, when they come, it just makes all these systems just that much more robust. Um, so people are working on it, but it, it's still a couple of years away. But uh, It'll happen longer than we. It'll, it'll take longer than we would like, but it'll happen sooner than we imagine. I think so. Yeah, the the innovations of 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 two years ago. You know, two years ago, people were talking about um, uh, uh, about all sorts of tech, technologies within 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 Bitcoin that are just now coming online. Um, and so, I think what you're seeing right now is all sorts of discussion and innovations in the Bitcoin 2.0 space that we're going to see. Emerging in, in 2017, 2018, um, that, that seems to be the pace at which we're going. Um, Roger, you've uh, you've been involved in in few startups actually for for years uh, related to Bitcoin. Uh, Blockchain.info uh, is probably the most significant one. It's uh, it's a website uh, which shows you the information about the blockchain and allows you to set up the free wallet without any any you know, KYC information or, or anything, and it's and it's free. It runs on on iPhone on on, uh, on Android. Um, can you mention uh, some other other startups that, that you would like to highlight? And, and you're involved yeah, um, there's there's so many. I know I already mentioned Purse.io, and I'm excited about that one because I think it really is a way to bring people that aren't philosophically motivated. Have I dropped or have Roger? He'll come. He'll come back in, in, in a second. I'm sure. Okay. Um. So maybe. Okay. Let's maybe pick up question from John Matlick. Uh, how do you acquire Bitcoin? Um. Uh, let's assume John is in the U.S. Uh, Jeffrey, you are as well. Can you say one or two of your favorite ways? Uh, I mean, you can always link up your bank your 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 bank account to some. Some exchange, um, Coinbase is of course the most most popular, and that's easy enough to do. I mean, you just click over there and and uh, buy Bitcoin that way. Another way is to have cash and and find a um, a local big lo local uh, Bitcoin ATM um, and uh, go over there and throw in your cash and and hold up your smartphone and, and that's it. Another thing is to find a Bitcoiner and perform a service for him or her. And get paid in Bitcoin, so you don't have to use dollars. You don't have to use some currency. You can always just, or in my case, my first Bitcoin was acquired by selling bow ties. So you can find something to sell. Uh, there's many ways to get it. LocalBitcoins.com allows you to meet some very interesting people in very interesting places, and um, you know get Bitcoins with, with cash. So there's many ways to do it. Bitcoin ATMs all over the place. There is a website. Somebody can post it in. Uh, the, in the chat, I would have to look through my smartphone to find out precisely what it is. But there's a, a really nice uh, app you can download that shows all the uh, places that you can go locally to um, spend your Bitcoin, um, and it also shows where all the lo local uh, Bitcoin ATMs are. If somebody has that link, uh, put it up there. Yeah, it's. What is it? Yeah, it's Bitcoin. Um... BitcoinATMMap.com. I'm posting it in a chat. Yeah, but there's and uh, I'll put it on. Yeah, channel. there's that, but there's there's another app that's that's really wonderful that shows exactly in your local area where you can uh, spend Bitcoin. You know, I think it's important to remember that. You know, people always ask me this question, like, well, how can Bitcoin be a currency if I can't spend it at my local subway um, or at my local sandwich shop? Well, the truth is that. Um, I still don't see the the right uh, link. Roger, do you know that what's this what's this app that that um, you can go to it and see every local place? Like it's it's it shows every the. There's a couple. There's Airbits. Airbits. Um, Blockchain.info has has a map built into their mobile uh, apps. Yeah, there, there's quite a few. There's CoinMap.org. Uh, there's a lot, and we'll see which one winds up kind of uh, becoming the market leader. Yeah, Air, Airbits was the one I was thinking about, but yeah, there's probably many others. I, I, I've enjoyed using um, Airbits. But the important thing to remember is that Bitcoin really is a currency f for the internet, first and foremost. Uh, it's really nice when people adopt it locally. I think it's really cool. And you can uh, download the Gift uh, app and use 
Bitcoin at McDonald's or Burger King or, or Target. You know, it, it, you can you can use it essentially anywhere with a, with a gift app using <clears throat> using that interface. So you just buy a gift certificate and and spend it. You can stay out of dollars completely. So there's many ways you can get Bitcoin, and many ways you can you can you can use it. Yeah, and in in regards to people complaining about how Bitcoin can't be used at at, at Subway or this and that yet, uh, if you think about it, you know PayPal isn't usable at you know your your local grocery store or your local Subway or any restaurant, and that doesn't mean that PayPal hasn't been an incredibly uh, successful payment network. Uh, and it's the same with the the Bitcoin network today. Although I think we are going to see it in more and more places in the physical world, but Bitcoin clearly has its strongest advantages uh, in the online world, and we're seeing really fast-paced adoption. I, I've been involved in Bitcoin four years. Four years ago, it was unimaginable that Microsoft would be directly accepting really? Bitcoin, uh, and here we are today with yeah, Microsoft and Dell and, and Newegg, and you know, more than, more than you can keep track of at this point. Uh, and then uh, one of the other businesses that I'm excited about, because I, I don't know where I dropped off the last time, but... Uh, there's another wallet company that hasn't actually launched yet, but uh, the website is luxstack.com, L-U-X, like X-ray, S-T-A-C-K. And uh, it's actually the former uh, CTO of monster.com. He was one of the original guys at monster.com, the giant web uh, jobs website. And uh, he's been hard at work on some pretty darn amazingly smooth uh, Bitcoin wallets and some other tools. And when those launch uh, publicly, I think people are going to really be excited uh, about just how smooth and nice those are. And it allows people to main 100% complete control of their Bitcoins. So uh, that's another startup to keep an eye up uh, on in the coming months. And that's luxstack.com. Isn't it just amazing how many uh, brilliant, wonderful entrepreneurs are involved in the space? I mean, you must feel some sense of satisfaction about this, you know, that you, you called it so well four years ago. I mean, I, I personally feel it, you know, having jumped into it under your tutelage, in early 2013, um, you know, I remember feeling like this is a little bit of a risk, but uh, you must you must feel a great sense of personal satisfaction to see this market booming. I mean, not just for yourself, but for the world. Yeah, and it, it's every day I wake up in the morning excited about you know what new things have people accomplished and and how how is you know what, what's the next business that's accepting Bitcoin and what's the neat next neat tool that we're all going to be able to use. I it, it, I can't think of anything that's more exciting to to work on than this, and I, I think everybody else uh, on this call probably feels the same way. Definitely. Um, I don't know how much time do you guys have. Uh, there's uh, maybe one or two questions that we could address uh, from the audience. Um, Let's yeah, that's fine. Just one or two sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Will we'll, will government take over the internet? Uh, affect Bitcoin? I, you know, my own. I think mesh nets are going to help with that quite a bit. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, one of the things about regulation and and government snooping and that sort of thing is that it has the opposite effect of what people think. People think it's going to deter people from Bitcoin. What it actually does is incentivizes people to get into the crypto. Ecosphere and stay there, because governments can only control the coming and goings of between national currencies and cryptocurrencies. But once people are in the crypto uh, world, um, you know, basically they can uh, completely disappear. So the more the, the the interesting thing is that the more government attempts to control um, the cryptocurrency world, the more they incentivize people to to get into it and 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 stay there. Essentially, so in other words, there's going to be an unintended consequence of these uh, growing controls. Uh, the second thing is that n that nations that uh, like the U.S. that are trying to regulate Bitcoin the way the same way they regulate cash or national currencies are going to be driving out businesses. I mean, already many Bitcoin uh, companies are refusing to do uh, business in, in the U.S. because um, of uh, regime uncertainty and onerous regulations and that sort of thing. They're losing out on job creation. I mean, the Bitcoin space is actually creating jobs and creating wealth. Uh, so it's not in the interest of, of a country like the U.S. to to do what many people are attempting uh, to do. I mean, already some of the most exciting Bitcoin companies exist out of the U.S. In fact, Roger, I'd be very interested in your your take on that. Do you, as an investor, do you ask that question? Are you planning to do U.S. Uh, do business in the U.S. or are you planning to, to, to stay outside of the U.S.? 
Um, everyone seems to think of me as, as this longtime startup investor, but I had never invested in any startup ever before Bitcoin. And the only reason I made it investments in Bitcoin startups is because I was excited about the, the way it's going to, you know, bring more freedom to people all over the world. So, uh, and I want to see that freedom brought to people all over the world, including the U.S. and including North Korea and including Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and absolutely everywhere. We're all human beings. We all live on the same planet. We should all have the same uh, equal access to Bitcoin, regardless of where we happen to have been born or what color our skin is. So um, I really don't care about that sort of thing. And the people that want to, to control others through violence and through force, uh, they need to stop. And they're going to stop like Bitcoin is going to be beyond their control. So I just have a giant grin on my face every day when I think about the fact that these people aren't going to be able to use violence to control other people anymore. That's the fantastic thing about what Jeffrey mentioned about um, being able to accept Bitcoin for whatever you provide. You don't need to ask anyone to do that. You just install a simple app. Uh, you connect to this cloud uh, blockchain, which is, as, as Roger said, everywhere and nowhere. And that's it. You don't sign anything. You you give no ID. Um, yeah, it's it's great. Uh, last question um, from the Roger: Will the Bitcoin blockchain be the end of uh, of all, or or do you foresee side chains playing a major role? So, for those that don't know, side chains are are still secured by the Bitcoin blockchain. So, so that there's a what is it? Uh, coin? There's too many coins and bits. What's the name of the guys doing the side chains? Uh, can someone else remember? Like, it's, it's it's some of the most the, some of the smartest people. No, no, that's not factum. It's it's some of the smartest people in all of Bitcoin, and I feel horrible Ethereum? that the, their name is escaping me. But it's it's Ethereum. After, nope, nope, no. Nope, it's after eleven p.m. at night here, so uh, I'll remember in a, in a moment or two. But uh, it was actually uh, Adam Adam Beck is one of the more interesting people that's been around in Bitcoin, and he's he's been in uh he's involved with side chains. And I remember he came up to me one time and he said uh. You know, he came up with Hashcash back in like the late 90s, which was kind of what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is based on that, but with inflation control where you limit the supply. And he said, if you're Bitcoin Jesus, I guess that makes me Bitcoin Abraham. And I thought that was a, a funny thing. But uh, Blockstream, that, that's the name of, of their organization, Blockstream. And they just raised 20 something million dollars to do what they're up to. So but uh, even, even if side chains become really, really popular and useful, which there's a real good chance they are, they're all still being secured by the computational power of the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's kind of two sides of the same coin there again. Okay, we'll link up. Blockstream is their company and they're doing really interesting things. We'll link up to Blockstream to, to the show notes. Uh, guys, thank you very much. Jeffrey, maybe a last word if you... If you no, can. I just wanted to, th I wanted to thank you for being there here, uh, for having me on. And <clears throat> yeah, I must say that we're really at the very beginning from an, from an intellectual point of view. We're only beginning to understand, beginning to understand the significance of the peer to peer revolution. There still needs to be a lot more thought and a lot more work on it. After I finished my book, um, I had, uh, maybe this happens with every author, but as soon as I put it to bed, you know, I, I woke up the next day with many, many other thoughts that I wanted to put in the book. You know, we live in an emergent world, you know, uh, with a plenty of surprises. We're seeing uh, freedom being uh, regained, uh, re-understood, and recreated and rebuilt by a new generation, thanks to these brilliant technologies. And I think the best thing we can all do is um, throw ourselves into it, um, also defer, look out the window, uh, be in awe of the world that's being built around us, stay humble, listen, learn, uh, engage, and help build a new world of freedom, because that's, I think, what's emerging, and we can all play a part and participate in it. So thank you for having me tonight. Jeffrey, thank you. It's always great hearing you make people optimistic. Um, thank you both. Thank you to viewers. Uh, join liberty.me uh, to, to get Jeffrey's book for free and to meet um, other other great people. And uh, once this is uh, this is online with show notes and everything, please share it so everybody else can, can see it. Uh, thanks, Roger. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you, Roger. Thank you for writing the introduction to my book. It means so much to me. And thank you, Tomas, for hosting us tonight. I think, thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.